So good evening, everyone. Welcome and thank you for attending our third annual gathering of the Robert Talbot Civil Rights Speaker Series. My name is Tom Pico, and I am the president and CEO for the University of Maine Alumni Association. It's an honor to have you all here. As we begin tonight, I'd like to share with you the University of Maine's land acknowledgement, which is also printed in your program, but I will, I will read it to you here. The University of Maine recognizes that it is located on Marsh Island in the homeland of the Penobscot Nation, where issues of water and territorial rights and encroachment upon sacred sites are ongoing. Penobscot homeland is connected to the other Wabanaki tribal nations, the Passamaquoddy, Maliseet, and Mi'kmaq, through kinship, alliances, and diplomacy. The university also recognizes that the Penobscot Nation and the other Wabanaki tribal nations are distinct, sovereign, legal, and political entities with their own powers of self-governance and self-determination. Thank you. The University of Maine Alumni Association is honored to continue our partnership with the Greater Bangor Area Branch of the NAACP in presenting this series and we thank the NAACP for their ongoing partnership with us. And we'll hear from their president in just a few minutes. We also want to thank Bangor Savings Bank for being a sponsor of this event for the third year in a row. So we appreciate the support of Bangor Savings Bank. This series was created to honor Robert Talbot's extraordinary leadership and impact in Maine. And of course, it is our honor to have Bob Talbot with us tonight. So. <laughs> We will, uh, there, there are a number of other members of the Talbot family with us tonight, which we're honored to have, and we're going to meet them uh, in just a few minutes. Michael will give a proper introduction to them. Through the University of Maine Foundation, a special fund was established to bring speakers of regional and national relevance to our campus through this speaker series, and to make sure that the program is, is accessible to all free of charge. Many thanks to those of you here today who have uh, already contributed to the Talbot Fund. And please refer to your program to learn more about making a designated gift to support this and future events in the series. At this time, it is my honor to introduce our university president. In July, Joan Fruity Mundy celebrated five years as the president of the University of Maine and our regional campus, the University of Maine at Machias. For the past two years, she has also served as the vice chancellor for research and innovation for the University of Maine system. She is an ex-officio member of our board of directors for the Alumni Association and a great partner with us on behalf of our 110,000 alumni around the world. Please welcome University of Maine President Joan Farini Mundy. Good evening everyone and welcome to the University of Maine. It's a pleasure to have you all here. I'd like to begin, as so many, and, and sadly so many of our uh, gatherings these days are, are beginning, with a moment of silence to acknowledge the uh, horrific tragedy in Lewiston. So if you could please reflect for a moment. Can you see? Thank you. It is just a delight to be here, to be together uh, with everyone for the Robert Talbot Civil Rights Speaker Series uh, this evening, and to have a speaker who is indeed both of regional and national significance with us, and um, the speaker, um, Rachel Talbot Ross, will be more properly introduced, but I would like to thank her for being with us tonight, and thank all the members of the family who are here too, uh, to, to uh, be with us for this event. I was pleased to be able to spend some time with Speaker Talbot Ross this afternoon as we did a little bit of a tour of the campus to show off some of our spectacular research and development work to meet some students, to meet some faculty. Thank you, uh, Speaker, for taking the time to do that with us today, too. We've, we've heard about nanocellulose and about 3D printed homes and so many of the other wonderful things that go on. And they go on in part here at the University of Maine because of our commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, and justice. We are a university that holds those values as central, as core, and the ways in which the extraordinary inventions and developments that you see here at UMaine um, are developed is because of the inclusion part of that commitment. The best ideas will come from everywhere, 
and we need to have people together with a variety of experiences, backgrounds, and perspectives in order to generate those best ideas. And so it's only fitting that we had a tour that showed off some of our best ideas, and now this evening we'll, we'll have this lecture. Very grateful for the support and partnership that we have from the State of Maine Legislature and from the Mills Administration. Grateful to the Alumni Association for putting this event together, um, and all of you for being here. There are a few leaders that I would like to uh, specifically acknowledge. This is always tricky. Um, hope I get this right. Uh, Dr. Robert Dana, Vice President for Student Life and uh, Inclusive Excellence. Yeah. Yeah. Kelly Sparks, who is a member of the cabinet and is Vice President for Finance and Administration, as well as the Chief Business Officer, Kelly. <laughs> Anila Karunakar, who is Director of our Office of Diversity and Inclusion. I think I saw Anila. Can you say thank you? <laughs> A couple of years ago, I established a President's um, Council on Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. If people who have been on that council or are currently could raise their hand or, or stand, um, thank you for being here tonight. Good to see you. And John Diamond, the former President and CEO of the University of Maine Alumni Association, a key individual in making this event happen. I spotted John earlier. Jeff Mills, the President and CEO of the University of Maine Foundation. Okay, well with that then, I would like to welcome you all. I'm very much looking forward to your lecture and um, turn it over to Tom. Thank you. Thank you. Our volunteer co-chairs of this event for three years have poured their heart and soul into making this um, all come together. And uh, you, you met him briefly a moment ago, but I want to again acknowledge my predecessor in this role and our volunteer co-chair this year, uh, John Diamond. So thank you for your leadership. <laughs> and uh, co-chair means two, right? So the other one, uh, of course, um, is uh, Michael Alpert. Michael is uh, not only a co-chair of this event, but is also the president of the Greater Bangor Area Branch of the NAACP. And Michael's going to come forward and offer some welcoming remarks from the NAACP and um, give an introduction to the Talbot family as well. So Michael, thank you for being with us. and with former director, John Diamond, has been a true pleasure. This series is named to honor Robert Talbot, a dear friend and leader to the civil rights community here in, ba in Maine and elsewhere. Bob has devoted most, much of his life to working for racial justice. He was the first executive director of the Maine Human Rights Commission and for many years, Bob worked as an investigator in the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Office of Civil Rights. Bob has been a member of the NAACP since the early 1960s. In recent years, he has been our branch treasurer. Throughout his many years of civil rights work, Bob has guided all of us with great wisdom and charm. There's more information about Bob in the back of your program. I'm also honored to welcome Maine House Speaker Rachel Talbot Ross, whose life of accomplishment is a testament to her inner strength, her integrity, and her intelligence. I am sure that all of you know Rachel's public presence, but you might not know the extent of her civil rights work. To cite just one example, Rachel was instrumental in organizing and sustaining Maine's NAACP 
prison branch, which has given inmates in Main State Prison important practical help and much needed hope for a more positive future. Today I have the, the pleasure to welcome other members of the Talbot family. At the end of the list, I will ask all the family members, except, except Jerry, to rise so we can acknowledge their attendance at this event. Beverly Talbot Scott, Bob's sister, and an important presence in the Bangor NAACP for many years. Gerald D. Talbot, Bob's brother and civil rights leader. Jerry was the first <coughs> black member of the Maine State Legislature. His work has been groundbreaking. And valued younger members of the Talbot family. Renee Talbot Gurlu, Beverly Carter, Billy Carter, Kiki Carter, Robert Talbot Jr., Haley Talbot, and Anita Talbot. Would you please rise so we can acknowledge you? significant progress since the days of official and unofficial apartheid. Uh, when official and unofficial apartheid ruled much of our country. We have partially peeled back the outer layer of racial oppression and made it shameful. But now we face more insidious forms of racism in ourselves and in our institutions. Racism sullies our institutions and our souls. For many people, society's highest values have not been valued, have not been realized, and our civic order remains cruel and unjust. As author and educator Ibram K. Kendi wrote, we are either anti-racists or we are racist. The kind, the kind of good words without good deeds that has crept, crept into our public discourse is not honest, it is not viable. I know I'm speaking to the choir. <laughs> you are all fine people, and quite a few of you are members of the branch. I would like to invite others to join. What I'm, what I'm saying is that following the lead of Robert Talbot, Gerald Talbot, and Rachel Talbot Cross, we must work more diligently to further civil rights, and we must speak more effectively. Thank you very much. <laughs> now, now it's Rachel's turn to enlighten us. So I, I appreciate the thoughtfulness. So uh, good evening, everyone. It is um, so lovely to be with you here uh, this evening. It is uh, a beautiful day in Maine, a cold day in Maine, uh, but dry. Uh, and so I, I'm really uh, excited to be with you here today. What a lovely day uh, we had. And I want to thank the president uh, for her hospitality today. Uh, it is extraordinary what's happening at this university, absolutely extraordinary. When you think you know everything that's going on here, come spend a day. Um, Sam Warren was so wonderful um, with the help of also Brian Hubble uh, to make sure that um, I was able to see award-winning, uh, nationally recognized, internationally recognized uh, research and development work that's taking place right here in the state of Maine. You all would be extraordinarily proud as I am. 
I uh, also just wanted to briefly acknowledge, I think Representative Lori Osher is here with me. Uh, she joined me today. She represents the city of Orono in the state legislature. And it was uh, Representative Osher uh, who invited me here just about a week ago um, to uh, attend and participate in a listening session uh, for the community that had been uh, most impacted uh, by a rise in the proliferation of hate. And uh, Representative Osha made sure that a multi-faith uh, group of folks came together last week uh, for this lesson right in this room. And I want to thank you for your leadership on that and for joining me today. Thank you, Representative. I believe um, Representative Collimore, is Amanda Collimore also here? Yeah, Representative, both representatives, would you just stand and be recognized? These two folks represent you in the middle <laughs> I just have to say uh, at the very beginning that I have had the pleasure of attending previous events and I want to uh, recognize um, John Diamond. Um, and it's very humbling to be able to stand before you today to recognize uh, one of my heroes, uh, and now one of yours, for the 2023 Robert Talbot Civil Rights Speaker Series. Um, I've known him all my life and loved him dearly. Uh, <laughs> but it's just, it is really, really wonderful. Uh, to know that the state of Maine considers him uh, a treasure as well. So, thank you, uh, Unc. <laughs> I'd also like to thank uh, Michael Alpert. Um, because of, of your efforts, the NAACP is thriving is, uh, in Maine uh, under some incredible odds and challenging times, and your leadership has been uh, unwavering. And I want to thank you for what you're doing for the state of Maine for your service to the state uh, and for making sure that the NAACP, the oldest civil rights organization in the state, still has a, a presence. So thank you, Michael. Um, I, I am going to start off this evening uh, in the same spirit in which the President led us uh, by sharing what I know is on top of mind for everyone, these, uh, particularly these last eight days and that is the tragedy that had occurred <coughs> in Lewiston. Uh, my heart aches, as I know yours does, for the 18 people that we lost, for their families, for their loved ones, uh, and the eight, 13 people who were injured, some or who are still recovering at this very moment. As we grieve uh, for Lewiston, for Andrew Scoggin, for our state, let us remember how resilient we are, how strong we are, and how committed we still are, uh, diligent in our commitment to ensure that every Mainer, all Mainers, feel safe and know that their state cares for them. Trisha Aslan, Peyton Brewer Ross, William Frank Beckett, Thomas Ryan Conrad, Michael DeSorio, Max Hathaway, Brian McFarland, Keith McNear, Ronald Morin, Joshua Seal, Arthur Fred Strout, Stephen Vazella, Lucille Violet, Robert Violet, Joseph Lawrence Walker, Jason Adam Walker, William Young, Aaron Young. <coughs> Keep them in your hearts. Tomorrow in Lewiston, uh, there is a Love Lewiston Day sponsored by Tree Street Youth. It's an important opportunity to come together to honor the victims and their families, honor the first responders and personally care for one another by blanketing that city with love. There will be blue ribbons to blanket the city with. There will be opportunities to write and distribute cards, and there will be uh, response listener trainings for those who are ready to help others process their grief and trauma. I hope that you will join me in Lewiston. This evening, we are here to honor a leader, my dear uncle, Robert Talbot. 
You know, uh, I think you know by now, that my father, Gerald Talbot, and my uncle set a pretty high bar for us. I, I think you would agree. Uh, a pretty high bar. But that bar was always framed um, by a commitment to public service that we had an obligation to not only take care of ourselves, but there was an obligation to take care of others. It wasn't enough to thrive on your own, to secure a good sense of uh, prosperity, but that we must take care of, we must give part of our lives, we must volunteer, we must give as much as we can to public service. And I'm very proud of the legacy that you said for us. Uh, my cousins are here, my sister is here, my aunt is here. I remember um, briefly as a child, uh, their mother, my grandfather, my grandmother used to um, drive a bus um, and make sure that uh, kids were able to get to school. So I'm, I'm very, very proud of my family's tradition. I, myself, am a ninth trainer, generation uh, mayor, and in my family are social workers and nurses. My family um, really, really does um, take pride in being able to give back, and uh, that is one of the things I think of most when I think of my uncle, uh, Robert Talbot, is his laughter, his humor, if you know him, if you don't know him, make sure you, you say hi tonight. His humor is uh, what gets us through a lot. But his dedication and commitment uh, to the greater good uh, is truly, truly what is spectacular about him. So many of you know that uh, my uncle will uh, spend his career, we heard earlier uh, in the remarks, uh, about his time uh, as the first executive director of the Maine Human Rights Commission. And it was his work uh, on this commission that really uh, set the stage for where we are today when it comes to our anti-discriminatory practices and policies. Even when, uh, decades ago, we passed the Maine Human Rights Act, as, as you know, the disparities still exist. And even though we passed the Maine Civil, uh, Civil Rights Act, years ago, decades ago, discrimination still occurs. For Maine to build a thriving economy where every Maine, regardless of their race or their heritage, we must be able to participate and allow people to achieve their full potential. What does it look like here in Maine? Well, as in the rest of the United States, people of color here in Maine are less likely to be hired for a job much less a job that fully utilizes their skills and education, or pays a wage comparable to their white colleagues. There are unequal outcomes for people of color, and the, and the result of the systemic barriers created throughout our nation's history at the federal, state, and local level. Barriers that have advantaged white Mainers while making it harder for indigenous communities, black families, and other Mainers of color to thrive. Mainers of color still face direct discrimination at individual levels as they navigate the economy. Research confirms continued discrimination on the job and in housing. So while we hear that the economy may be booming for some and that unemployment is low, that sale, home sales are astronomically high, we have to pull that back and see what it actually means for all Mainers. White Mainers consistently have unemployment rates much lower than those for Mainers of color, meaning that white Mainers are more likely to find a job when they are looking for one. In some cases, white Mainers are half as likely to be unemployed as Mainers of color. This is true even when comparing Mainers with similar education levels. For example, black, Latino, and American Indian Mainers with a bachelor's degree have similar unemployment levels to white Mainers with a high school diploma. Mainers of color are twice as likely to be experiencing food insecurity than white Mainers, meaning that they often struggle to afford even nutritious food at a very basic, basic, basic level. Mainers of color are more likely to have difficulty paying for health care, for, ch for child care, and children from poor families are more likely to struggle in school. In addition to material outcomes, large racial income gaps create psychological and social problems including increased feelings of 
competition, anxiety, and a lack of trust between communities. Readers of color also face other hurdles. Some studies suggest that college education may help to narrow employment gaps because a degree acts as an independent signifier of value to a prospective employer who would otherwise be inclined to discriminate against a job seeker of color. However, access to college education remains generally more difficult for people of color in large part because they are less likely to bear the financial cost of attending college. And also, the increased likelihood of people of color, especially black and Latino Americans, to have histories of involvement with the criminal justice system is just yet another systemic barrier to equal employment. This is in large part, I do not have to tell you, because of the discrimination we see in our criminal justice system. Black and Latino Mainers are more likely to face arrest, be treated worse by police officers once stopped, and face harsher punishment in the justice system. A recent review of Maine's justice system confirmed that arrest rates were more disproportionate for drug offenses, and especially for Class A and B arrests, which are more serious and carry bigger penalties. Black Mainers are also much more likely to be sent to prison on a first offense compared to white Mainers. The possession of a criminal record, even for fairly minor offenses makes it much harder for people of color in Maine to rehabilitate and get a job. Criminal justice reform, as has been mentioned, has been so important to me during my time in the legislature for these very reasons. And then individual discrimination by employers also remains a significant source of employment gap for Mayors of color. All this data, all this knowledge must inspire action. It is what I carry with me every day as an elected official and a speaker of the House. These threads are woven through our laws and I know uh, we are all, I know, we are trying our hardest to create coalitions and inspire others to make these changes along with us. If Maine wants a healthy and productive state population and an economy which all mayors thrive, we must adopt new laws. We must create public policy, righting the wrongs of our nation's history of discrimination. We cannot lie to ourselves. This is an introspective exercise. We must tell the truth about who we are and what our history informs us in order to make any progress in the future. I do believe we are making progress, however. I really believe that we are. Less than 10 years ago, we achieved full marriage equality across the nation. But here in Maine, we had been leading on this issue for decades, and we didn't give up. In fact, it was in 1977 that my father sponsored the very first bill to advance human rights for all people, regardless of sexual orientation. That was 1977. That was a bold step, and we thank you. The NAACP branches in Maine were solidly behind this legislation, which did not pass. It took almost 30 years to finally pass this legislation in 2005 to add sexual orientation to the Maine Human Rights Act, and then to successfully defend it against a referendum that was sponsored by the Maine Christian Civic League. And in 2009, my uncle, Robert Talbot, and the NAACP stepped up again when they were fully behind a crucial effort to allow a segment of our state's residents to join one of the most important institutions in our civil society, marriage. And I can tell you that uh, the testimony that you gave uh, in the Civic Center, people stop me to this day and thank you for your bold words, uh, for, you, for you standing up uh, for all Mainers to be able to access this institution of marriage. Thank you. As an organization uh, that had fought for 100 years, the NAACP, to end discrimination on the basis of race, the NAACP would not stand idly by when we finally passed marriage equality in 2012. It was a culmination of years of work, and that was progress. And to this day, we're still making progress when it comes to full LGBTQ equality, 
We have passed legislation to protect transgender individuals from discrimination, reaffirming our commitment to the principle that everyone should have the right to live openly and authentically. Our work does continue. We've also made significant, significant strides when it comes to improving civil rights here in Maine. This past year, we passed a bill, an act to prohibit profiling and to strengthen civil rights in Maine, which will require a designated and trained civil rights officer in every law enforcement agency in the state. And while this law codified the prohibition against profiling, it also provides the public with a dedicated resource to address a wide range of civil rights issues. This will help keep Mainers free from behaviors that violate their civil rights and hold persons who violate their civil rights of others accountable for their actions. This bill allows and requires law enforcement agencies to make contact information for designated civil rights officers publicly available so that members of the public know where to turn if they feel the civil rights may have been violated. We brought this up last week uh, during our listening session because we often get asked as legislators, what can we do? What is it that we can do uh, to mitigate uh, the rise in hate? And part of the answer is that now you can turn to any law enforcement agency in this state and know that it is a resource for you uh, in order to uh, file a complaint and to get support and help in addressing the issue. Uh, law enforcement uh, is prepared in this state, I'm proud to say, to help us as we mitigate and we try to uh, end uh, the horrific uh, violence that occurs um, from, from hatred. We also, uh, I, I want to thank, I want to take just a moment to thank Representative Osher because uh, the listening session that she organized is part of a body of work that she is leading in our state uh, to make sure that uh, the impact of neo-Nazism uh, is, is not, does not continue. So I want to thank you, Representative Osher, for your work uh, on that issue, for your continued work on that issue. We've continued to clarify and strengthen and refine the Maine Human Rights Act. We've enhanced its strength. We've added more classes of people of protection. We've made uh, sure that violations are protected uh, records. And just this past session, we increased the caps on Human Rights Act uh, violations by an employer. That is progress. That is absolute progress. It, it's taken us over a decade to um, increase those caps on human rights violations. It is progress, and we know that this work must continue. Another area where uh, Maine, I believe, uh, is leading the nation is around one of the original tenets of the civil rights movement, and that is access to the ballot box. I am so very proud of the work we have done here in Maine. We have made it easier for our citizens to exercise their right to vote, ensuring that the voices of all Mainers are heard. Uh, Michael uh, mentioned our work in the prisons, I am really proud to say that within this past month, the Secretary of State, uh, Shana Bellows, uh, joined members of my staff, uh, and we went to the main state prison, uh, to the prison in the, uh, Wyndham, to the women's facility and the men's facility. And as we, um, as the NAACP has done for almost two decades, we registered residents of that facility uh, to vote. Because in Maine, since statehood, uh, residents in our correctional facilities have always had the right to vote. That uh, we have not, that, that enfranchisement has never been uh, questioned here in the state of Maine. It's one of the things that makes me very, very proud. And I thank the Secretary of State um, for joining uh, with us in order to do that. We've passed same-day uh, same voter registration. We have implemented automatic voter registration. And by refusing to pass restricted voter ID laws that make it more difficult to vote instead of easier, uh, we have now made access to absentee ballot uh, boxes. Uh, we've kept that since uh, COVID. And we know that um, simple absentee ballot protocols are in place. That is progress. I would just take another moment to mention another issue that's really important uh, to me, and I know that many of you um, have worked on this uh, for years, 
uh, and that is to make sure that we strengthen protections for individuals with disabilities, acknowledging that everyone should have the same opportunities and access to public life. Just four years ago, we passed a bill that said new construction of any public building must include single occupancy ADA compliant toilets because of course, of course, they should. But the work even in order to make the lives of individuals with disabilities full and rich still continues. We have extended protections to vulnerable populations, work to remove barriers that hinder individuals from realizing their, their full potential, and we consistently champion the idea that civil rights are human rights. I do want to just mention um, the passing of a true icon in Maine just three days ago, uh, who was an absolute champion, uh, just voracious around uh, her uh, thinking about access to justice and making sure that, that all Mainers have it. So many of you are probably aware um, that we lost uh, Representative Lois Galgay Reckett, a dear, dear, a dear friend uh, of my family, of mine, and a colleague in the legislature. I can't let this uh, moment pass without talking about the civil rights uh, legacy she leaves behind. Uh, Lois was a trailblazer. She was a feminist, a proud feminist and relentless in her efforts on behalf of Maine women and children. She had a wicked sense of humor, a deep love for the Red Sox, and an unmatched dedication to the causes and the people that she believed in. We will never forget her courage, her resiliency, and her fierce, fierce dedication to justice. Because of her and with her support, we've passed legislation regarding pay equity making sure that compensation history inquiry is prohibited in regards to disparities in pay on the basis of sex. We made accommodations for pregnancy-related conditions under the Human Rights Chapter of Law. We passed legislation to prevent discrimination against domestic violence victims. That is progress. But in her honor, in her honor, in her memory, we must, we must continue. Lois was um, an advocate, a uh, fierce advocate. She spent decades of her life uh, fighting for the passage of the ERA. And while we're not successful, uh, we haven't been successful in passing that in her lifetime, despite her best efforts, we will carry that work with us and continue to try to make progress in our state. As we look ahead, uh, I know and I can see in each and every one of your eyes that we will remain diligent in our commitment to justice. Our commitment to civil rights should never waver. We must work to address the injustices that persist in our society. We must continue to fight against systemic discrimination, the economic disparities that divide us, and any other obstacles that hinder the full realization of the human right, the human dignity, civil rights of all. Ultimately, civil rights are not a fixed point in history. They are an ongoing journey, and it is our duty to ensure that every mayor, regardless of their background, has the opportunity to live a life free of discrimination and injustice. I remain very hopeful, very, very hopeful, uh, that we will get there. I remain hopeful that we will not become complacent in our jobs, and as hard as it is, that we will not get cynical in the face of adversities. In the spirit of tonight, let us recognize that our work is not yet done, and let us continue to build a Maine where everyone is treated with dignity, respect, and fairness. And the true, true legacy of my uncle, Robert Tell. Thank you so very much for this opportunity to address you tonight. It's been an incredible day. I want to thank the president once again, uh, and I will say God bless.
Um, Speaker Talbot Ross is going to um, take questions that we have from the audience. We would ask you to wait for the microphone to come to you because we are recording this and we want the recording to pick up your questions as well. So if you have a question, just raise your hand and we'll bring the microphone to you. Shy group. I'm not asking you to make this a roast, but I would love to hear a story about Unc. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are, there are just so many. I mean, he really is, um, has such a great sense of humor. Um, you know, my uh, sister, uh, Renee, who uh, does not live in Maine any longer, I'm going to remind her of that all the time. <laughs> she uh, is, uh, lives in the Netherlands. Um, in a small uh, village um, outside Amsterdam called Bedekon, uh, where she raises her two sons uh, with her husband. And she was here just uh, a couple of weeks ago. She's now back. Um, she can't stay away. But uh, she was here just a couple of weeks ago. And I drove my father and mother up to see my auntie, um, Aunt Beverly, and my uncle. Uh, uh, we call him Butch, so my uncle Butch. Um, <laughs> And when we, uh, we had a really beautiful day here in Maine, one of just spectacular with the leaves that had turned, um, and just really having enjoyed ourselves. And we came and we went um, to see my uncle. And uh, the story that I'll share with you is just this big heart, this big smile, uh, a glow. He comes out of his, uh, out of the, uh, his home, and the minute he saw my sister and my father, just absolute joy um, came out, and um, we knew uh, that that our uncle was doing really well uh, because his smile—you can, you know—his smile is just big and full of love. And we spent a really wonderful day with him. Um, you know, it just picked up right from where we all left off. And so the story I'll share with you about my uncle was just how much love he has. And he's always giving it away. <laughs> Hello, good evening, speaker. Good evening. I um, would like to, you had mentioned um, uh, shying away from cynicism. Right, something that we all may at times find ourselves succumbing to. Um, so my question for you is regarding uh, younger generations, or especially the students um, here at the University of Maine um, and elsewhere within our state, um, what is some advice you have for, for us who find ourselves at times maybe dipping into that? Uh, where, where's the light? Um, what advice do you have for us? Uh, that's, that's a big question. I, I will say honestly I struggle with it. I mean, I think, I think we all do. With, um, in this particular last couple of weeks has been very hard. But, you know, I wake up every day knowing that if I let the politics of fear, um, you know, permeate uh, the politics of hatred, um, that my, my son, uh, that the younger generation, that the students here, um, will not be able to live a quality life. And so I, I, I don't have great answers for you, I would say, uh, Self-care is probably, and my family will tell you I'm not great at it, um, <laughs> but I do, I do know that that is part of the answer, is that um, my brother-in-law um, told, told me the other day uh, on the phone uh, that there is a reason why when you're on a plane uh, and something may be amiss, they tell you to put the mask <coughs> on first. And so I would say to take care of yourselves, to make sure that the balance um, in your life you can maintain, you can, you can, because it, um, we, we must, uh, you know, take care of our health. I know that um, it, it is a struggle, it is a struggle, but we must, we must take care of ourselves. So I would say self-care is probably the best advice to give you right now, and to not give in to this politics of fear, and the politics of hatred, uh, because that's, that's, it's designed to keep us apart. Thank you so much, Speaker.
speaker for your words. Um, I'm a recent faculty I moved here in June from out of state, and I was wondering if you could speak to uh, coming to being from out of state, you sort of notice rather quickly that it's disproportionately white here, and I'm trying to learn about the history of Maine to understand why that is, and I wonder if you have thoughts on strategies in terms of welcoming immigrants, welcoming people of color um, to the state of Maine. It's a wonderful place to be with wonderful opportunities and what some barriers might be, um, and also what we can do just as members of the community to create a more welcoming Thank you, I appreciate the question. I, my mind immediately went to legislation, of course, um, because I, I do believe that um, the best way to welcome anyone um, you know, is to make sure that you have a society uh, that does not have built-in disadvantages uh, for them. And here in Maine, uh, it's no surprise that uh, we welcome, um, we're good at welcoming uh, people, I'm not so sure how well we do at making sure that they can stay and live a healthy life. Um, you know, the disparities that we see in education and employment and wages and wealth and health, um, they have been around for decades. This is not a new phenomenon. And so, you know, I would say that Maine needs to confront some of its past uh, in order to reduce those disparities uh, in uh, you know, past laws that make sure that we're not building in inequities um, and that we're doing all that we can to provide people with opportunity. The best welcome map would be one in which um, you can uh, have a good life, uh, that you can stay and you can have a good life. So I um, know that uh, my colleagues and I are, work every single day to try to reduce uh, any disparities, rural, urban, north, south, uh, race, racial disparities, disparities <coughs> based on gender. Uh, and I would just say that, unfortunately, I think with this latest uh, tragedy, um, you will find that um, we need to recommit ourselves to making sure that nobody lives a life of despair, because every single life is precious um, here. I, I wish I had a better uh, answer for you in terms of um, feeling good about that, um, but I don't. I think we have to. I think we have to work to make sure that we disrupt disparities in people's lives. And uh, Maine's demographics, I think, can work as an advantage to them. And uh, I, I've seen the growth in in racial dis. Diversity over you know the last 40 years, it's wonderful, um, and I really hope that um, that we can see in each other, no matter where we're from in the state, and no matter what our background is, no matter what our racial heritage is, that we see um, and take and take action to make sure that those lives are lived well. You know, if you don't ask me a question, I might talk a little bit more about legislation and policy. <laughs> <laughs> and then we did this. LD. <laughs> yeah. Speaker, thank you so much. Uh, for your words. Uh, my name is Otis Bryan, everyone. I actually just moved here from, well, a year ago from Long Island, New York. I'm an admissions officer at Gould Academy in Bethel, Maine. Um, so I'm curious, you, you mentioned that you're a ninth generation Mainer, and as an amateur historian, I'm so curious uh, because I carry my own family's narrative with me all the time. My folks had me so late in life that I'm only one generation removed from their experiences in the Jim Crow South. Uh, so I talk about how they were part of the post-World War II Negro migration to the North. But unlike many other African Americans who uh, went to work in the munitions factories and other industries, 
um, they could only do what they knew how to do, and that was to farm. They were sharecroppers. They were migrant workers to New York, to Maine, to New Jersey, to Connecticut. And so after several cycles of doing that, they settled in Long Island and major agribusinesses. I'll get to the point of just preface. No, it's <laughs> um, um, After several cycles of doing that, um, they settled in Long Island because major agribusinesses in the Northeast and wealthy farmers would go down south and recruit black workers. And my parents and their friends took advantage of that because they can make more in one season of harvesting in the Northeast than they could in an entire year down south. And so it really resonated with me when you mentioned that you were a ninth generation Mainer because it also reminded me of when I traveled to Anchorage, Alaska some years ago, and I had some of the best, I mean the slamminess best soul food I'd ever had in Anchorage, Alaska. <laughs> and I asked the brothers and sisters there, how did you get here? And they recoiled and said, bruh, we've been here for five generations already. And that was Anchorage, Alaska. So I'm curious, nine generations, where was the genesis of that? I appreciate your personal story. Um, and I'm going to say that I would not dare talk about uh, my family's history with my Aunt Beverly in this room. <laughs> There's no way, because I don't want to be tested when I leave here. You know, um, we, are, we are truly blessed as a family. Um, I, I have um, three historians that I get to look up to. My father, my uncle, and my Aunt Beverly. And my Aunt Beverly has done, I would say, the most work um, in looking back at our family history and our family tree. Um, and she uh, has a room in her house uh, that, that literally looks like a tree. Uh, and she has mapped out all of the um, names and birthplaces and children, all of the lives um, of the people uh, that I come from. And I tried to get her to speak about it um, many years ago at an NAACP event. And she said, well, I'll leave the speaking to the rest of you. I'm going to just keep doing my research. But I am proud to be a ninth generation um, Mainer. Uh, and I um, you know, often uh, start with that because many people, because of the demographics, um, their first question is usually, when did you get here? And then I get to jokingly, laughingly say, eh, yeah, a, a, a while ago. <laughs> has a, a proud uh, history here in the state of Maine. Um, a lot of uh, my family, particularly on the Talbot side, uh, have come down from uh, Canada, from the New Brunswick, um, and the uh, Quebec uh, you know, province. Um, and then my mother's family, um, as you mentioned in the migration, uh, came from the south up. But uh, we're very proud of our of our family history that uh, you know came down uh, and settled in Bangor, and uh, one of my fondest memories is uh, seeing my grandmother, um, who uh, just again um, had this big, big heart. The moment you met her, you she embraced you. Uh, she did that for everyone. Uh, taking care of taking care of my my other aunt, um, Beth. But just watching her, the care that she gave uh, her, and then my grandfather, who was a chef at the Bangor House, and his father was a chef, my father was a chef uh, at the old Bangor House. That, uh, uh, and so I just, I, uh, we grew up uh, in a family full of love and uh, a lot of blessing, a lot of blessing. But you're not going to get me to tell you anything more <laughs> than my Aunt Beverly sitting here who will scold me if I get anything wrong. Thank you. Hello, Madam Speaker. Hi, hello again. It's nice to see you again. Yes. So I was at the listening session last week. My name is John Guzman. I'm a third year student here at the University of Maine. And um, Madam Speaker, I just wanted to revert the question to students. So in this in the session, we talked about you know passing legislation and 
racial equality, and also gender affirming care. And as stated in the session last week, most of the marginalized students that this legislation would refer to are centralized within the university, centralized at the University of Maine and the University of Maine system campuses. So my question refers to how the legislature is kind of taking that student approach and being kind of more interactive with the student body. Because I feel like students, you know, the same. Those who seek knowledge will find it. Most students kind of live in this kind of inner scope where they're not really connected with the legislature or they're not connected with their state representatives. Um, so how are you going to those students, approaching those students? Like, what is your idea in terms of providing that information to the students in a way that they're able to digest it and go, hey, this is not a concept that I was familiar with, but this is something that relates to me, is important to me, because the whole main kind of initiative which is, you know, we want more people to stay here, to find this place to be a home. And I feel like those students who come in from different states, different areas, kind of just see the top layer of the cake and go, oh, my people aren't here. Why am I not finding my community? But in essence, there is community here, but they're not seeing it, and they're not seeing how the state is caring for kind of who they are as individuals, what they stand for, so how are you doing that approach? Uh, well, I thank you for, for your question tonight, and thank you for your participation in the listening session uh, just last week. Um, you know, I um, trust that um, there are a number of resources uh, within the university um, that uh, actively connects students uh, with um, public policy and the debate and the discourse around um, public policy. Um, you know, we had a program years and years ago that uh, unfortunately uh, ran out of funding, but we had a program years and years ago called Excellence in Education in which we tried to match the students of color at Bates, Bill, and Colby, the University of Maine system. The University of Maine uh, here at Arno participated in that program um, as one of the founding uh, college, uh, colleges to it. But it was called Excellence in Education, and the, and the reason for it was to try to uh, uh, make sure that our students of color knew that they were valued uh, while they were going through school, knew that they had resources in the community to connect with, um, and that upon graduation, that that we literally uh, tried to keep them here, uh, whether uh, from Maine or from um, from away. But it was a seven-year effort uh, working with presidents of of uh, those systems to specifically um, put our arms around our students of color, knowing that there were different challenges for them on, on campuses. Um, it is something that could be revived um, because what I hear um, from you and others um, routinely is that some of those challenges are still are still with us. You know, a number of students of color uh, saying that they're the only one of them in a, in a classroom. Uh, and when I was growing up, uh, my sisters and I, shared that experience. We were the only ones in our classrooms and therefore had to account for and be responsible for the teaching and education of all the other students in those classrooms about an experience that we really weren't even sure we knew how to describe. Uh, we, were all, we were trying to develop our own identities and while you're trying to figure that out, you're being forced to, in many ways, uh, train and teach others about who you are. And uh, it's a very, very painful place to live sometimes. But um, I, so I'm sure that there are students right now on this campus who are the only ones somewhere. And um, I think uh, uh, we can do better. We certainly can do better. And perhaps that there, there is a way forward in reviving something like that that allows um, us to really show our young people of color, our students, that they are valued. We want you here. We need you to stay here. And if there's anything that we can do to support you and your work, I know that the president oh, uh, and, and I would do that. Um, absolutely, absolutely. Representative Osher, um, I believe, will keep us coming back. Um, I know that we've already uh, tried to reach out to some of the student uh, union 
folks to see if we can come back and hold a listening session with, with uh, students here. So I thank you for pointing it out. I wish I had more concrete um, help, uh, but um, I, hope that we, I hope that we move forward and, and, and can stay in touch on that issue. Thank you for your work. And I'm going to relieve all of you <laughs> oh, if there's any more questions. No, I think uh, we're going to uh, uh, move to our reception here in just a second. But Speaker Teller Ross, thank, thank you again you. Thank very you much for being here. stay for a few more minutes we will have a reception just in a couple of minutes down the hall with some refreshments and an opportunity to interact with speaker Talbot Ross and the Talbot family but I do want to thank again our partners from the um, Bangor NAACP and uh, Michael and John for your leadership of uh, pulling this event together we're very grateful our sponsor in Bangor Savings Bank I do want to give a special shout out um, to behind the scenes the staff of the Alumni Association who have been working tirelessly to pull us together too so um, if you have a chance to say hello and thank them we appreciate it so uh, thank, thank you again for coming please join us for a reception down the hall and enjoy your evening <laughs>